Welcome to Moments with Melinda, my new TV interview show that will focus on sharing with you the stories of interesting Vermonters who have a story to tell. My first guest on my new show is Bernie Lambeck. Hi, Bernie. How are you? Melinda, I'm great. Thank you for inviting me onto this show, especially the first one. I'm honored. Well, I'm so excited to have you with me. And I just want to tell our, our, our guests that Bernie and I serve on the board of ACLU Vermont together. And it's been such a pleasure to, to serve with you on that board. Now, you are a Vermont attorney and you are releasing today your second novel, An Intent to Commit. So, Bernie, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about your early life. My early life, my early life began, unfortunately, a, a, lot, a lot of years ago. So I'm from Montreal, um, Canadian, although I became a naturalized American citizen in the 1980s. Um, my parents uh, were refugees from Hitler's Germany. My father from, was from Germany. My mother was from Czechoslovakia, but both German-speaking Jewish families. And they ended up meeting in Montreal, and I'm one of three of their sons. Um, and, uh, and went to Dartmouth College from Montreal. That's what brought me to the States and to Vermont or, and New Hampshire. Um, after Dartmouth, I, um, I did a few things, uh, including eventually teaching elementary school for a few years. Then I went to law school. So I lived in the Upper Valley where Dartmouth is for a few years, ending up in, in Thetford for several years and where, where I was living, where I met my wife and was living and had two of our kids. Then we went to New Haven, Connecticut, where I attended Yale Law School. Uh, my third son was born there. And uh, after three years of law school, we decided to move to Montpelier uh, in 1988 and we're still here. Um, I'm right now sitting in my office in downtown Montpelier. Great. That's, Great. that's the early part. That, well, well, that, that's, and, and thank you for that. Um, so I know that you're into social justice and racial justice, and you've been involved in that for your entire life. Um, so who in your life had the biggest impact on you and your commitment to fight for those who are disenfranchised and whose civil rights are violated? Oh, I don't know. It's hard to choose one person in that. But um, when I lived in the Upper Valley, especially my last year at Dartmouth and in, the, and in the two or three years after that, I was very active in the peace movement and, um, and social justice movements. So there were a lot of movement activists that uh, influenced me a lot and that I looked up to. Um, and then when I got involved in law, you know, my uh, certain professors at Yale Law School um, were influential. And after law school, I clerked, uh, was a law clerk first for Justice Jim Morse on the Vermont Supreme Court. He was new on the court and had me as a new law clerk. And uh, he became a lifelong friend. And as you know, he was also on the ACLU board um, for many years. So I clerked for uh, Jim Morse. Uh, for two years. Then I clerked in the federal court in Vermont with Judge Fred Parker, uh, who was an enormous influence on me. Um, I clerked for him when he was a district court judge, and then I went back and clerked for him when he was appointed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York. And uh, he had chambers in Burlington, and so I was in Burlington, but we would go to New York uh, regularly for a week at a time to hear arguments. Um, that was 1994 in 1995. So Bernie, um, you, went for, you went from lawyering to novelist. Tell us about that transition in your life. Yeah, well, I haven't left lawyering. I'm still lawyering. Right. You're from your lawyering, but you've, you've, you've gone from yeah. your lawyering into being also a novelist. Yes. Yeah. I just decided, um, so Uncivil Liberties, uh, this book here, which was published in um, 2018, I, I really started work on it a good seven or eight years before it was published. So I think it was two, 2011 that I began to work on a novel and it was just new for me. I didn't know what I was doing. I just decided to give it a try. And I wanted to write about the law. Both of these novels are very much about the law, particularly First Amendment law. And I want, and I've always been a reader of mysteries and a lover of mystery novels. 
And so I wanted to create a mystery that was serious about some of these legal issues that I care about. Tell us a little bit about Uncivil Liberties. What's it about? Yeah, Uncivil Liberties is, um, uh, it, it, well, both of these books take place in Montpelier. And the, the, the issue in Uncivil Liberties, the main issue, it has to do with the death of a, a high school girl who she's found dead at the beginning of the novel. And it turns out she was the, the, the victim or the subject of um, some home, homophobic writing on Facebook by a schoolmate of hers, a friend of hers. But um, this friend, his name is Ricky, and he's the main character in the book, um, is, is a, an evangelical Christian and believes that um, she is wrong, that his friend um, is wrong to be living a, a as a lesbian, and so he calls her out on it, and then she's found dead, and so there's, so there's a mystery about what caused her death. Um, so the issues, the the legal issues involve free speech in the schools, whether students have a right to engage in speech of the type that Ricky engaged in, um, which of course is called hate speech by some people. Um, there's other issues, legal issues, uh, anti-discrimination law, a principal gets fired, and there's a question of whether she was discriminated against. Um, there's another set of legal issues around um, um, uh, town meetings that take place and uh, prayer at town meetings, whether uh, it's permissible under the Constitution to hold a Christian prayer um, at town meetings. So I, I explore all those legal issues. And um, that's a quick summary. So now I haven't read on civil liberties. But I do understand that Ricky, who, by the way, is a black man. Uh, no. no, he's not. Not. He's not. Aha. <laughs> well, I had the impression that he was. Well, that's interesting. That sort of changes um, changes my perspective here. But anyway, but but Ricky and Sarah are both pulled through through that novel and into your new novel, or at least yes. Ricky is an intent to commit. Yes. Yes. So tell us a little bit about um, about the second novel that we're going to talk about today, an intent to commit. Yeah, um, it, it, it's. A, a sequel of sorts from the first novel. And as you're noting, it um, includes some of the main characters from Uncivil Liberties, particularly Ricky and Sarah are, they're, they're sort of the younger generation of characters in Uncivil Liberties, and they feature as the protagonists in an intent to commit. And uh, some of the other characters from Uncivil Liberties have less central roles in the second novel. Um, the the uh, focus um, is that S Sarah Jacobson is a, uh, an activist, becomes an activist um, organizing in the Black Lives Matter movement in Vermont schools. And um, there are legal questions about schools' ability to fly the Black Lives Matter flag and whether students with a, a different viewpoint or families with a different viewpoint have a First Amendment right to have their own flag once the school has chosen to fly the BLM flag. So there's some there's some court action around that. Um, but then the heart of it gets to some hate mail and um, opposition um, against Sarah's organizing and other activists organizing around these issues in the schools. And ultimately, um, it's not a secret, um, Sarah is kidnapped by some uh, right wing zealots and the, 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 the plot focuses on the kidnapping and the resolution of that. And uh, the opposition wanted to be able to, uh, to put up a flag to support, was it uh, their gun rights? Gun rights, yeah. Gun rights. Yeah. So you get into, I, I find this so interesting that through this whole book, Ricky was a black man for me. And I saw him as that. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, that is interesting. And he well, always, there's another he always character. Will be, he always will be to me. I, 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 <laughs> he lives in my brain. But um, Sarah has another has a, has a boyfriend from an earlier period in her life, and there's um, a whole section kind of looking back on that. And he is he was a black man. Tyrone, yes, right, yes. Yeah, Tyrone, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, so thank you for setting the stage for your book. Um, an intent to commit. 
And for my the folks that are just uh, just tuning in, I am talking to Bernie Lambeck, who is a lawyer in Montpelier, who's written a wonderful book called An Intent to Commit. And it is actually being released tonight, uh, Thursday, November 18th at the Lost Nation Theater. So um, I'm so glad that I got you before you released your book. I feel really honored about that. Now, Bernie, Intent to Commit is set here in Montpelier. So how much of your novel is, is, is true to form? Is, and yeah, you're right. The setting's Montpelier. And some of the events um, are based, some of the events in the book are based on real events. So the flag flying at Mont Montpelier High School, uh, the BLM flag, and the BLM flag flying at U32 Middle High School. Um, those events happened, and I drew quite largely from articles in the press particularly the Times Argus, um, about those events. And some of the qu quotes I used are quotes from the students that were participating uh, in the flag flying ceremonies. So that part is based on real things that happened in and around Montpelier. Um, and some of the, the places that I describe in Montpelier are real places. Sometimes I change the name, sometimes I don't. Um, but the kidnapping story is entirely fictional. The main characters are entirely fictional. Um, so there was there was not a, there was not a challenge to flying the Black Lives Matter flag in Montpelier, but you created that and then you weave that incredible legal story uh, that flows through your book. Are you Tad Sorowski? No, no, I'm not. No, you're not. Tad Sorowski is this uh, as you're mentioning it. She he's the the school district's lawyer. Yes. Um. And, um. No, I mean. The lawyer, Sam Jacobson, who's the more or less the protagonist of Uncivil Liberties and appears um, only um, in a few places in an intent to commit. He was originally based a little bit more on me. Okay. Um, kind of started out that way. You know, you write about what you know and all that stuff. But um, what I needed to really do as I was writing on Civil Liberties is to separate the character from myself and create him as his own uh, true fictional being. And so he departed from me, but it was never, never Tad Sarowski. <laughs> okay, never Tad Sarowski. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, so I, I would love to have you read from your book uh, for my viewers. And we're gonna, we're gonna focus on, uh, so why don't you set the stage for what you're going to read to us um, on page 35 of your yeah. book. Set the stage of what, what our folks are gonna hear from you. Right. Uh, very good. I'll read that. And Sarah Jacobson is featured in this section. She, at this point in 2017, is still uh, living in Providence, um, Rhode Island. Uh, and uh, she hasn't moved back. She's from Vermont, but hasn't moved back to Vermont yet with Ricky, which she does in the book. But in fact, this scene here directly precedes and is part of the the reason why she chooses to move back to Vermont. So let me begin. On a cool day in October 2017, almost three years after Tyreen's death, that's Tyreen, who we mentioned a moment ago, Sarah was sitting on a bench in the scrappy park next to her workplace on Manton Avenue in Providence. She wore blue jeans and a red jacket filled with some kind of microfiber, zipped up over a scarf. She faced the busy road with her cell phone in her hand, and an egg salad sandwich on a sheet of wax paper in her lap. Traffic whizzed by, and the sun that cleared the buildings on the southern side of the street warmed her body. She scrolled through her emails, reading some, saving a few, discarding most. In the Human Rights Network newsletter, she noticed a posting for a job at an organization called Green Mountain Black Lives Matter. Looking to her right down the street, she saw a family with a stroller on the sidewalk at the end of the block heading slowly in her direction. She watched them briefly and returned her attention to the phone. She followed a link in the job posting to a website for Green Mountain BLM. It was a newly formed Vermont organization that was looking to hire a staff person to be its youth organizing coordinator. Sarah knew there were other BLM organizations active in Vermont. This one appeared to be focused on middle and high school students. There was movement in the hills of Vermont. The family on the sidewalk came closer to her. They were Hispanic looking, probably Guatemalan, she thought, like many of her clients. 
The mother was pregnant. At this moment, the man crouched down to fix a wheel on the stroller that had gone kinky. Sarah smiled and waved to the toddler in the stroller, but she didn't think the girl saw her. On the sidewalk to her left, Sarah noticed three young men with barrel chests. They had a kind of rolling side-to-side -side gait that made her think they were proud of their masculinity. Sarah worked for a nonprofit, coordinating campaigns to organize local residents in the Latinx community on issues relating to immigration, workplace abuses, and foreclosures. But internal divisions embroiled the organization. Meetings had become awful yelling experiences. Some who professed a, a passion for equity and inclusion engaged in the worst personal attacks. Sarah didn't see much light through the tunnel her workplace had become. On top of that, she hadn't been paid for three months as expected funds had not materialized from granting agencies and donors. She was ready to jump. The whole thing made her sad. The wind picked up. Putting her phone down beside her, careful to balance the sandwich on her lap, she pulled the scarf up around the back of her head. Her scarf was Guatemalan, given to her by a member of her organization. Sarah had grown up in Montpelier, Vermont's small capital city, and she wondered about returning home and whether Ricky would want to make the move. Sarah was the only daughter of Donna and Sam Jacobson, parents whom she loved and fought with and had needed space away from. Ricky had grown up in Montpelier too. Ricky's parents, Clara and Carver Stilwell, were conservative Baptists, a rarity in Montpelier. That was complicated for Ricky. Now there's an understatement, she thought, smiling. One of the young men on the sidewalk to her left wore a t-shirt that said, white motherfucker. Words that she could read as they approached, but embroiled in her own thoughts, she couldn't understand their meaning at first. All three men wore baseball type hats. They were red. Sarah now saw they were emblazoned with the MAGA letters, make America great again. The kneeling Guatemalan man, if that is what he was, stood up from the, his stroller repair, looking at the three white men who were still walking toward the family about 30 or 40 feet away. Sarah could see him then glance down at the girl in the stroller who was probably his daughter. The street was busy with traffic. The father looked for a break in the traffic. Sarah squinted into the sun's glare and watched the little family, her egg salad sandwich still on her lap as she clutched her phone. If not for the sandwich on her lap, she would later think she might have gotten up to do something. She didn't know what it was she might have done. An opening appeared in the traffic and the family stepped onto the road. The stroller wheel was still not functioning well and veered to the side, so the father picked up the little girl with his right arm and lifted the stroller off the pavement in his left hand. The woman held onto his arm and they tried to cross. It all took too long. By the time they reached the middle of the road, cars were coming fast in the opposite lane. Five cars sped close by them as they huddled in the middle of the street, horns blaring on all sides. Over the traffic noise, Sarah could hear the toddler who had begun crying. Sarah felt rooted to the bench, watching, gasping, as a moment later a gap in the traffic appeared in the far lane and the family rushed across to the other side. The father dragging the stroller behind him as he held the girl and the mother's arm. Before they made it clear to the far sidewalk, a delivery truck with its horn peeling slammed the stroller, which flew from the man's hand. The truck didn't stop. The stroller airborne clattered to the gutter on the road's edge. One of the wheels was knocked free and kept rolling down the street. The MAGA hat guys had reached the pavement in front of Sarah and she could hear their deep male chuckling. Across the street, the family on the far sidewalk, apparently uninjured, reassembled themselves. Both parties continued on their separate ways as Sarah sat still on the bench and watched. The traffic on Manton hummed. Sarah let her breath slow down. She ate her egg salad sandwich carefully so nothing would fall into her lap. She turned back to her phone and finished reading about Green Mountain Black Lives Matter and the new job. She decided she would talk with Ricky that evening. And so she did. And so Indeed. she did. And she, she did, did talk to Ricky that evening. 
You have a, a, a beautiful style of writing, Bernie. Um, it flows, it's narrative, it's visual. And, um, and I want to tell you, this book, I had trouble putting it down. I really enjoyed your style of writing because some of it is very tough to understand. I mean, the legal part that gets into the minutia of, of, of the law, but you, you explain it beautifully and you do it with color and you do it uh, with ease so that, the, so that the reader can understand it. Um, so I want to thank very you. Kind, that. Very well, kind, want, thank you. Well, and I want to, and I want to recommend to everybody who's watching this show to, to order an intent to commit by author Bernie Lambeck. And Bernie, um, where can folks get your book? Um, uh, so well, Bear, Bear Pond Mo Books in Montpelier is carrying it, um, but it should be available from any independent bookstore and they can order it if it's not on their shelves already. Um, it's at Amazon as well and can be ordered through Amazon. It can be ordered directly from my publisher, which is called Rootstock Publishing in Vermont, and one can find their website easily enough, Rootstock Publishing. Thanks, Bernie. Um, now, Intent to Commit focuses on the period uh, under the Trump presidency, and it, and it focused the, the reader on racial injustice and white supremacy. Um, and uh, it's just, it, it was a really important book to read after all we've gone through and what we're about to face heading into the future. So I wanted to ask you, and I don't wanna give you anything, anything away at the end of the book, um, but I, I love the end of the book, but I do want to know what happens to Sarah and Ricky. So I expect that you're going to write a third novel, right? And hopefully you'll carry on these characters because I, I am so intrigued with them and they're such beautiful, young, brilliant, uh, kind-hearted and loving human beings. And I would love to see them in your next novel. Now, Bernie, um, how do you see the state of our union over the next five years? Where do you think we're going to go with, uh, with where we are and where we're going, I'd love to get your perspective. Oh my. Uh, I, was, uh, I was enormously pleased that we had a change of administrations um, and really hopeful uh, about the Joe Biden presidency and the administration. Um, and I am still hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful he's gonna get this second huge bill passed. Um, but the uh, the intractability of the Republican Party and the direction they've gone in is, to me, just so overwhelmingly awful that it's it's hard to maintain maintain that hope in the face of that. I don't know where we're going. I wish I could say something more positive about that. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, my friend. Um, I. And and there's hope. There's hope. Um, but I I agree with you that it's um, and we don't need to get into it because you and I talk about all this stuff um, in the work that we do. But at the end of the day, um, your book shines a light on an issue that's really really important, um, which is the First Amendment. And where wh where do you stand when you want to fly when a school district wants to fly the Black Lives Matters flag, and then you have another group that wants to put their flag up. Um, talking about um, gun rights. And at the end of the day, you spell out the legal, the, le the, the legal story and the legal reality and the legal truth of how this, this would play out. And, um, and, I, and I think you did that beautifully. Do you wanna share a little bit about that? I know you don't wanna give, the, give up the, you know, the context of the book, but share yeah. a little bit about how that was resolved. And you as a lawyer must have yeah. researched it and put out your, your best vision of how that would have been resolved had it happened, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy to do that. I mean, it's interesting to say the legal truth of it, um, but keep in mind these are uh, contested uh, issues, and uh, I guess we we rarely have a, a legal truth um, until the U.S. Supreme Court spoken on something, and even then, we don't necessarily have I a truth that's long. I should have, exactly. <laughs> I, I should have said your legal truth that the yeah, truth that, you believe. All right, Bernie's. No, I'm not being. I'm not being critical. I'm just right. just trying to. Thank you. Uh, well, you're a lawyer, and thank you for yeah. correcting me. You've corrected me on a couple of things tonight, today, and I appreciate <laughs> it. But, but certainly, uh, could you share a little bit? Yeah. So the the um, 
the resolution, I, and I think it's the correct resolution, is that it, it, it's the, the school as, a, as an institution of government that is doing the speaking when it flies a flag on a school flagpole. It's not the student group that might have urged the board to fly the flag. It's really the board making that decision. And once it's government that's doing the speaking, then it's not creating an open forum or a public forum for speech on that flagpole. And so other groups don't have a First Amendment right. If it were a public forum, then groups that are um, want to use that forum do have First Amendment rights to use the forum. That's that's this doctrine called public forum analysis that First Amendment lawyers are familiar with. And the question really is, is whether the flagpole becomes a public forum in the relevant sense. And, and I don't think it does. Um, but, you know, these are arguments. That's right. And, and this and, and have you seen a situation where this has popped up in your in your career or not? Yeah, I mean, it, it has popped up. Um, so when when um, the the uh, Washington Central uh, School District, which includes U32, was um, considering uh, a policy on use of the flagpole, um, the, the board emphasized that it was the school board's decision whether to fly a fl any particular flag under that policy. I mean, all, there's always, there's the US flag and there's the Vermont flag. And then the question is, can they fly a third flag? And they have a policy that says they will accept requests to fly a different flag and it has to specify certain things and it, it, certain content is prohibited. But once the request is submitted and the school board considers it and votes on it, then it's, it's deemed to be speech by the school district, by the school board. So the policy is actually written to, um, to further the argument that I was just making about it being government speech and not a public forum. Right. And I want to say, because we're coming to the end of our show here, Bernie, but I want to also say that this is a mystery because Sarah gets kidnapped. Yeah. yeah we haven't talked I, also, I also love the relationship between the parents and Sarah and, and, uh, and the other folks that were in her life that surrounded her in her life and how they came together as this beautiful group of human beings that, that sought to, to find her because no one knew where she was or whether she was alive. Um, and it was certainly horrifying for her as well. And I'm not going to tell the end of the book, but it was a mystery as well. And you weave that together so beautifully, Bernie, to make it a read that I literally, I, I'm going to just admit it. I read this book in like two days. I, I, I would get home from work and I would just sit and read this book, your beautiful book and get through it. So thank you for writing it. I'm going to go back and read your first novel and I'm going to wait, <laughs> wait deliciously for your third and um so to my viewers and to you bernie i want to thank you for being here and for being the first guest on my new show moments with melinda and to my viewers out there i want to wish you all well and wish you a happy thanksgiving and i will see you soon thank you so much melinda i really appreciate it thank you bernie thank you